All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks again. Uh, once again, today we're going to be discussing Canadian registration and a little bit of the demystification of it. Um, today's geography is interesting because we do have seven, uh, seven states represented, uh, but more importantly, we have five countries. We have uh, folks from the US, England, Canada, uh, of course, including our presenters today, uh, as well as India and Mexico. Uh, we have a, a good group of engineering customers, OEMs, packagers, uh, and skid builders, and even some of our manufacturing partners who uh, are, are oftentimes confused and, and challenged by going about getting their, their products uh, accepted for CRN when they're building it. So again, um, we're pro certainly proud of our 160 year history. Uh, we've become a trusted source for process components that keep plants operating safely and efficiently and projects running smoothly and on time. Our customer base, um, many of you represent, is quite diverse and skilled. Uh, and do work on highly complex projects. And again, we're certainly proud of the role we play in helping navigate the toughest industry challenges, um, as is our host today. So our business uh, consists of three groups, our Procore group, uh, OEMs, custom engineered equipment, packagers, uh, engineering, uh, and EPCs. And that represents the lion's share of the attendance this week. Uh, again, our process group focuses on a lot of our MRO uh, customers, chemical, pharmaceutical, contractor, et cetera. And our most recently uh, added group is our high temp fabrication, uh, where we manufacture high temperature insulation prod, uh, products, refractory, uh, and scientific surfaces. So today, again, we do have Steve Munn uh, with Pressure Vessel Engineering, uh, or PV Ang, uh, as well as Ray Stroud. Uh, they're both joining us today. And we have Dan Morgan. We have Greg Barrell, and again, it's me. So once again, I like to uh, just talk a little bit briefly about the presenter. I have Steve just a little bit about himself and certainly share with me some hobbies, kayaking, motorcycling, uh, fishing, uh, mountain biking. Uh, but he also mentioned that he raises chickens and I was able to find this unedited photo of him and he sure does look happy around all those chickens. But uh, um, that is Steve there at his neighbor's farm. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dan Morgan, who's going to go through just a couple of the housekeeping details. Dan. Yep. Thank, thanks, Kevin. And thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, I just want to mention a few things here uh, regarding the, the interface and how we're going to you know, run, run things here. So um, as, as Steve is going through his presentation, um, we obviously you know, want you guys to participate with uh, you know, any questions you might have. So um, you'll see a questions panel um, in the control panel in front of you. Um, so feel free to submit questions through there. I will be keeping an eye on that. Um, and then, you know, letting you know that, that we're going to, you know, either answer your question, ask Steve the question, or possibly get to it at the end of the webinar. Um, and then once Steve's finished with his presentation, um, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of open it up to the floor a little bit. Um, and if you're comfortable asking a question, you know, out loud in front of everyone, what we're going to do is ask that you, you know, raise your hand. Um, so there's a there's a button you should see um, called raise hand and what I'll do is uh, you know if your hand is raised I'll you know I'll, I'll unmute your microphone um, and then you know give you the floor and allow you to ask Steve a question um, or you know at the same time you could still uh, submit the questions through the the, the text if you'd like so um, yeah let's have it um, so with that I will now turn it over to Steve. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And I assume everybody can see the screen. Yep. Okay. As we all know, we're here to talk about Canadian registration number. And one of the things I want those of you familiar with it to think about are some of the emotions that you felt in going through the CRN process. Uh, we've heard people talk anywhere from frustration to anger to fear. Um, just to get into it and make it a little bit less painful for people as we go. That's what our goal is. A little bit about us, Pressure Vessel Engineering is a Canadian firm. We're located in Waterloo, Ontario. We do have customers from all around the world in pretty much any industry that has pressurized equipment. We specialize in CRN registrations, but we do help with finite element analysis, code calculations, pipe stress analysis, and do drawings as well. And we're willing to help with as much or as little of a project that you need a hand with. So. So the difference between national board registration and CRN registration is in the US, you have one body, the national board, you submit your design registration to them. 
with a UNA form, and you can use that vessel anywhere you want in the US. In Canada, it's a little bit different. We've got 13 different jurisdictions with 13 sets of rules. All of them claim they have safety in mind. Uh, if you read through the TSSA strategic plan, their headings all include public safety first, safety matters, new ways to safety, a mandate for safety. ABSA's vision is to lead in pressure equipment safety. So everything is geared towards safety, but different regions have different codes that they want to apply. In British Columbia, uh, seismic zones are much more a factor than anywhere else in Canada, so they have different different rules with regards to seismic there. In Ontario, they have different rules with regards to uh, PNG requirements. In Canada, in a lot of the provinces, you need a pressure or a professional engineer stamp on your design registration. In Ontario, you need an Ontario pre uh, professional engineer. The rest of Canada, if they need one, it's just anywhere from North America. So the different types of CRN registration that you'll see are basically a vessel, which can be a pressure vessel, boiler, heat exchanger, or autoclave. Um, when we're dealing with those, it's a standard registration for us. If you're dealing with a fitting registration, it can be a flange, a pipe fitting, um, pressure relief valve, strainers, all different types of fittings. Used equipment is another style of registration. It's typically done as a one-off and it'll be to a location that you're installing the used equipment in. And piping is also a registration that's done based on a location. You'll get, uh, you can create the same piping system and install it in two different locations. And you'll have to get two different P numbers or piping registration numbers. When you do submit your CRN registration, you have to, you have to validate the design. The most common way and the preferred method for most of the jurisdictions is through ASME calculations. You can do this through any number of commercial packages such as compressed design calcs or um, PB Elite, which we have in our office, all three of those, or you can do your hand calculations or any way that's using the ASME code calculations. If you've got some kind of geometry that isn't allowed by any of the ASME calculations, then you have to find another method to validate your design. This can be through burst test or finite element analysis. If you're doing a burst test, you have to have it witnessed and the report has to be signed off by a national board inspector. If you don't get this done, you'll have to redo the burst test and have the inspector present and sign off on it. When you're doing finite element analysis, you have to follow the guidelines for each province for your report. And uh, we've done a vast number of FEA reports for all the different provinces. So our reports typically try and incorporate what all of the provinces are looking for to make it a little bit easier. When you register a vessel, uh, you'll see that small vessels registered in Canada when they're not necessarily registered in the US. If it's less than six inches in diameter in the US, you don't need to register it in Canada, you do. Um, if you go on our website, you can see we've got uh, an article doing have a vessel or fitting, so you can kind of follow it through there. You still need to register your, your vessel with the national board, even if you're getting a CRN on it. Uh, other than Ontario, but it, you might as well, good practice would be just to get your national board registration. Um, the process for registration is somewhat similar to national board in that you have to submit um, paperwork, drawings, calculations, and submission forms to the provinces that you do want to register it in. Typically, you would register it in one province and then from there take it to additional provinces if you need registration in any other provinces. And be aware that some provinces do require a professional engineer stamp. Uh, Ontario, for example, does need a stamp for pressure vessels, whereas Alberta does not. When you're looking at a vessel CRN number, the CRN itself is on the design. And that design can be used for just a single vessel or for multiple vessels, all of the same design you are still allowed to move nozzles around, and I'll talk about generic registration shortly, um, but even a standard registration, you have some leeway with what you can do as far as moving nozzles, subtracting nozzles that weren't in the original design. This CRN number does not expire. It's valid until there's a code change that requires a change to the calculations or, or the proof that the vessel had, and the CRN number must be put on the nameplate. Each province or territory in Canada is given a number or a letter, and the structure of the CRN number is basically a letter goes at the front, 
followed by three to five digits, this becomes your CRN number. So in this example, your CRN number starts with A1234, and then there's a decimal point. The numbers after the decimal point signify the provinces that you've registered it in. With the initial submission, in this case is Ontario, which you can see is five, and it's also been registered in one, two, and three, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. If you were to take it Canada-wide, you could shorten this once you had the registration paperwork from all the provinces. This CRN number could then be shortened to A1234.5C. You keep the five to signify which province it was initially registered in and convert it to a C. Some fitting registrations are exempt in certain provinces. So if that's the case and you did get Canada-wide other than the exempt provinces, it would become 0.5L for limited. Generic registrations are something that we think more companies should do. Um, one registration can cover multiple designs. You only have a few criteria that you have to meet and the diameter, design conditions and material type all have to stay the same. And that's about it. You can have different styles of carbon as one material or different styles of stainless. So you can have a generic design that incorporates 304 and 316 stainless. And you can have it range from, if it's a, an eight inch vessel, you can have it range from 20 inch to 100 inches long. You can have two, four, eight, 10, 12 inch diameter nozzles. And you can have as many of those nozzles as you can fit on as long as you maintain the minimum spacing between nozzles. So you're allowed to do all that. You create a registration drawing and then you can create an as-built drawing that's a subset of that registration drawing that only includes the, the nozzles and the configuration that you set up originally for your customer. But your registration typically runs about twice as much in terms of cost to get that registered as a generic design because of the additional engineering work that's required. But when you go and do that second um, configuration, it's already paid for, you don't have to wait then for the registration process, which can be a, a huge problem for some people, is the uh, length of time the registration process can take. So all of that is eliminated with the generic design registration. Fittings, these encompass valves, flanges, pipe fitting strainers, pressure relief valves. All of these types of equipment are considered fittings. Small fittings don't require registration in the United States. In Canada, they do when they're used in the piping system, and in some cases, like flanges on vessels as well. Um, with a fitting registration, the fitting is valid, or the registration is valid for 10 years. You can build as many of your fittings as you want in those first 10 years, at which time, after the 10 years is up, you have to renew the design. Um, you do have to create or sign a statutory declaration. The statutory declaration is a legal document. It gets signed and notarized by your company stating that you have a QC program and that you will use that QC program to create the parts. And this is what means you don't have to have an authorized inspector. With a vessel, every vessel you build, you have to have an authorized inspector on site. To, they'll put hold points on it or whatever the case may be so that they can see it being constructed with fittings. That's not in place, so statutory declaration takes the place of that and you take care of the QC control. You can do a catalog res registration if possible, so every category of fitting can be a separate CRN. So we'll get to that in the next slide, but uh, flanges, you can incorporate all your different sizes and styles of flanges into one registration. Only the logo is required on the component. You don't have to put any other markings as far as the CRN is concerned. You don't have to put the CRN number like you do on a vessel, just the logo of your company, and this logo is included on a statutory declaration as well. So with the CRN number for a fitting, typically it's zero and then a letter, and the letter corresponds to the category of the fitting. So if it's a, a flange, it'll be a B. So in this case, zero B, and then CRN number 0232.5C. Again, the 0.5C signifies it was registered in Ontario first and followed with Canada-wide registration. The design is valid for 10 years, and then you renew it at which after that point in time. A category H fitting is a little bit different than the other fittings. It's typically made up of a series of other registered parts. It can be like a piping skid where you've got um, 
maybe you've got a strainer on it that's got a registration number already and you're just creating a bunch of uh, piping and elbows with that which would not be registered so you would calculate the, the piping itself and include the registration numbers for the uh, for the strainer and then the, the unit the assembled unit together gets its own registration number again you only need a logo on any of the fittings whether any category some of the provinces have ex have exempted some of the of these fittings so you'll see categories a b c and g are all exempt in british columbia saskatchewan and manitoba and in quebec categories a b and c are exempt when they're used in a piping system only if they're used on a vessel then you still need to get them registered hey steve uh, we actually had just a couple of questions come up here regarding fittings so um actually a couple of attendees have, have asked the same thing so i thought it might be a good thing to address in sure. front of everyone um essentially they're they're expressing that they've they've had some difficulty in finding um crn rated uh piping and fitting components um in pvc or cpvc material um is it applicable that a crn registration would would apply to a, a pvc or cpvc material or is it only uh, metallic components no plastic components can be registered. It's more the design conditions that dictate whether or not the the design has to be registered. And that varies based on uh, the piping and the conditions and what it's used for. It varies by province and by fluid that's contained. Okay, got it. So it would potentially be applicable, but uh, depending on application. So, all right. So we've, uh, we've registered lots of plastic fittings, but again, the piping, I'm not sure Ray might be have a little bit more experience with the piping itself. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult with, with plastic piping. It's going to be hard to find uh, fittings with the CRN because it's not very common. Um, there are some PVCs in the piping code. The issue with, with plastic or PVC, if you will, is typically we have to do a burst test because the allowable stresses are not provided or, or available from the manufacturer. So we have to burst test them. Uh, plastic piping or plastic fittings in general have to get to 10 times the required pressure in the system. So um, we can run burst tests, we can provide that information, but it's so uncommon that it's difficult to find the fittings. In most cases, we have to do it on a project by pro project basis but if if the system is is carrying high pressure high temperature or or steam or oh, i guess it wouldn't be steam but but something caustic or something like that and it does need to be registered then the fittings do require crns okay all right great um i guess to those who who, who asked that question let me know if there's any follow-up to that we'll make sure to to get an answer for you but thank you guys so as i mentioned before piping is registered by the address of installation you can have an identical piping system being installed in two different cities you still need two separate crn numbers just something to be aware of the address of installation is actually included in the crn paperwork Typically, piping is made up of a collection of registered fittings and vessels, as well as a calculated components like pipe. So you would submit a registration sheet with P&ID and calculations for the piping and a list of all the CRN products included in it, as well as a P&ID showing how, what the layout is. Every province has different requirements for piping registrations. Uh, the easiest way, I think, for you to do it is to go on a province by province uh, checklist we've got flow charts on our website listed by province and if you go there the link is here i'll include the presentation for dan to post on Pearson's website we're also going to put this up on our website so you can find the presentation there and all the links to the different provinces and the requirements are on our website already now so typically a piping system is greater than 1.5 cubic feet if you have a piping system that's under you can register it as a category h fitting which is much easier for you to register. If you're looking for registered components, it used to be that ACI Central was the only place to find it. ACI is the jurisdiction that covers the Atlantic provinces in Canada. They have a website you can search by 
company name and you can do some browsing there. Alberta, ABSA, they've also created a, a directory. Uh, you can search there. I think it's by, uh, by CRN number only and possibly by manufacturer. We've also put a website up listing all the manufacturers that we've kind of dealt with that have uh, components that have been registered with CRNs. If you do want to be on the list, just send us an email and we can add you to the list if you're creating components that are registered. We find that a lot of people have difficulty finding registered components. So if we can get some way of allowing them to find it more easily, that's our goal. It's free to put it up. We're just trying to help people to get their products registered. Some of the challenges I'm sure people are aware of is that uh, you do have to submit to every jurisdiction you're gonna sell your product into. If you are bringing it, importing it into Ontario, you have to have an Ontario CRN. If you then wanna take it to Alberta, you also have to get it registered in Alberta. You can't just take it to one place. Uh, every province has their own unique rules and even the reviewers within the jurisdictions can have different requirements. It depends on who you're dealing with. That is not their goal, but that it is a reality we've come to come to find. The timelines between provinces can vary very widely. So I would suggest that if you've got a registration for a fitting now, plan about a year in advance before it expires to start getting the process started to get your registration renewed. It does take some time, especially now with the, with the outbreak we're in. We've noticed a slowdown in a couple of provinces. They've picked back up, but it's a little bit slow in Manitoba at the moment. So knowing all the little pieces of information and making sure you've got your information all included on the original submission does make things go a little bit more smoothly. Make sure you've got all the information for your burst test, your FEA reports, and know that if you registered a fitting 10 years ago, you probably need a bit more information to get it renewed. In the past, you could submit a, a catalog of parts along with your statutory declaration and a copy of your QC certificate and from there you would get your registration completed. That is no longer the case. You do have to prove the designs either through burst test calculations or a finite element analysis. There is hope though. Uh, NAPSAC is a national safety authority in uh, Canada. They have dictated that there will be a harmonization of the CRN. So provinces are currently working on that. It is being tested right now on a limited basis. So the goal is that you will submit your design electronically through a web portal and you'll specify which provinces that you want to register with. And one of those provinces that you specify will perform the original initial review. Currently you can select which province you want to do the initial review but down the road that won't be the case so I didn't mark it on the slide. Uh, other provinces will then have, after the initial review is performed, other provinces will then have a, a set period of time to add any questions that may, they may have. You'll get a package come back to you with a series of questions and this will be the only set of questions that you get. In the past you would submit to one province and get questions from them, get your CRN and then you would submit to all the other provinces individually and all the provinces would send back their questions individually. So this will be a huge time saver once it becomes a reality for everyone. You'll get all your questions at once, and then when your CRN is accepted, you've got all the provinces at once. So it should make things a lot easier. Uh, when I spoke to ABSA about this, they said that the, the statutory declaration will be replaced with an ISO statement of conformance. Basically, the idea is to eliminate the need for the notarized documents, which will then make it easier to have electronic submissions. Currently, two of the provinces are still requiring that you send in the original copies of your statutory declaration. The others are right now allowing photocopies. And they know that this is coming, so I think they're preparing for that now. So I hope that helped explain a few things. I'm sure there's lots of questions. The process does change every year. One of the best changes we've seen in a long time will be harmonization but we will keep everything current as we can on our website. And if you do have any questions, feel free to contact either Ray or myself. Um, we have access to our phones. Uh, we're all working from home at the moment, but we have access to our phones and our email. So we can answer any questions that people may have.
Thanks very much. Thanks. If you've got questions, please let us know. Yep, there is actually a couple of questions we have right here. Um, going back to the topic of piping, um, so this is actually something that's come up a few times for us. Um, we've actually had some discussions with you guys about this. Um, essentially, you know, when you're talking about fittings or piping, it does piping and tubing itself require a registration? No. Piping and tubing itself is calculated. So as such, it becomes a calculation as part of your piping registration. The components, if you put in a flange or you put in a strainer or a valve, those components would have to have a CRN of their own, but the pipe itself is calculated. Okay. Uh, perfect. I'll just uh, remind everyone here. We're gonna, you know, if, you, if you'd like to ask a question here uh, in front of everyone else, just uh, you know, please raise your hand, um, and I'll kind of go through you uh, one by one, and um, and we'll, you know, unmute you and allow you to ask a question, um, or you know, continue to, to to submit them through the the questions pane, and I'll get them asked of Steve. So um, looks like we got a couple more. Um, they're coming in. So uh, one more here. So when there's a skidded system. Okay, is it true that you can get a CRN number for the entire system instead of getting CRNs for each individual component? Ray, is that more? I will let Ray handle this one because, yeah, no, the um, the skid itself does need a CRN, but you still have to provide CRNs for the components that you purchase. If you're making a component, so for instance, if you were making the flanges yourself. Uh, we can provide calculations for those because they're being made under your QC, which is going to be used to register the skid. But if you're purchasing that same flange, uh, the only way for the jurisdiction to know if it's one meets the ASME code and two meets your design requirements is if it has a CRN. Um, so there's there's really no way to get around finding CRN components, unfortunately. Okay, um, let me know if there's any follow-up to that question. Um, is there a target date for this harmonization that you're that you're aware of? No, I asked that exact question when I was on the phone <laughs> with ABSA, and they don't have it. The goal is sometime in the future, near future. <laughs> All right. Uh, they've been working on it for over a year. I know it's been talked about for at least five years, but this is the first time we've actually seen action taking place on it. So they're hoping to have it more widely in use by the fall. I know things happen with uh, with the COVID outbreak that have slowed things down as well for them. But uh, I think the goal is to open it up a little bit more this fall to other companies. We're trying to get uh, involved as part of the process too. Cool. Okay. So hopefully more soon on that. Um, all right. We got a couple of maybe application specific questions here. So um, are there certain pressure temperature limits that would make a system exempt from CRN? Um, really talking about Alberta and Quebec specifically, if that matters. Um, and the application would be for like chemical uh, and water service. Yeah. So generally speaking, uh, anything below 15 PSI or one bar is exempt from registration completely, regardless of service. After that, it's going to depend on that flow chart that Steve referenced. Uh, the, the screen is up now, actually, the piping screen. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so if you look at Alberta's flow chart, you'll see oh. they list you know, it, the very first question, is this an expansible fluid? So if it's water, it's not expansible, therefore it's exempt. If it isn't, then you go to the next, and, and you just go down that list. Um, and that's, that's the process we do for every piping system, every skid uh, registration we go through for each of the provinces that's required. Uh, Quebec does not register piping systems they are inspected and um, they sign off on the system at the time of inspection. But you still have to build it to the ASME code. And other than the fittings that are exempt, 
um, A, B, and C, you still need CRNs on those fittings. So there's no magic number uh, that you can say, oh, okay, it's less than 100 PSI, it's exempt in Alberta. It's going to depend on what the media is, the, the pressure, the temperature, and if there's an exemption for that situation. Yeah, like here's an example with on Ontario, diameter, volume, uh, temperature, based on hot water systems, if it's hydraulic fluid, if it's oil, liquid's not more hazardous than water. Everything has a different uh, flow chart you have to follow through, so. Right. Okay, all right. Uh, let me know if there's any follow-up to that one. Um, got a couple more application-specific questions here. Um, could you maybe explain if a CRN requirement, or if a CRN is applicable uh, or required for um, anything that's like non-pressure retaining, like an expansion bellow with atmospheric pressure or an atmospheric tank? No. Anything under 15 PSI does not require registration. So atmospheric conditions do not require registration. Right. If okay. you go back to that, that flow chart, Steve, from Ontario there, um, the very yeah, first pressure. very first question, is it greater than 15 PSI? Yeah, or is it less than in this case? If the answer is is no, then it, you're, that applies for vessels, piping, whatever category of registration. Now, I mean, if this is something highly dangerous, there may be another code that you have to follow in Canada, but it's not the CRN. It's not CSA B51. So um, there are no requirements below 15 PSI. Now, uh, the only exemption that I've ever heard of to that was steam piping in Newfoundland, but that's pretty specific. And I don't know if it needs to be registered, but it doesn't specifically say it doesn't. So, uh, but generally speaking for the vast majority of situations, if it's less than 15 PSI, it's exempt from registration. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, got a couple more here. Uh, so, Let's say this is a very specific example. It almost sounds like it has happened before. Um, if a pressure vessel has been you know, reviewed and has a Sierra number assigned, then a change occurs that's a non-design change. Uh, so paint, for example, um, and that, that change causes a change in the part number. Mm -hmm. um, does the design need to be reviewed again or can that same CRN number still be applicable? You can it's, use the same CRN. Yeah. If you're my my suggestion would be to create a drawing that has the new paint code on it or whatever, and you create a new drawing number, reference the original drawing that the CRN was registered to, and then you're fine. The only time you need to update your CRN is if you need to update the calculations. Any other changes you do that don't require updated calculations are fine. If you want to move a nozzle, you can. If you want to make the vessel shorter, you can. Calculations don't have to be updated for either of those. If you want to put, you've already calculated a one inch nozzle on the design and you want to put six more of them on, you can. It's already calculated, it's already on there. If you've got a one inch nozzle on the shell and you want to put a one inch nozzle on the head, you need to update the calculations. Therefore, you need to update your CRN. But if you want to put more of those nozzles on the shell because you've already calculated, already registered that way, you're free to do so. If you've got a six inch and a four inch and a two inch and you decide you don't want to put the four inch on, you don't have to update your CRNs. So you don't have, to, no calculations have to be updated. So just omit that on your uh, on your new build. Same CRN covers it. Perfect. Okay. Um... Another question here. So if, uh, say you, you manufacture a fitting, um, this, this fitting is, or you know, component is designed to leak um, or bleed at a certain pressure um, higher than the design pressure, um, rather than like a catastrophic fail, um, how exactly would a, you know, a burst pressure be conducted um, or would that requirement be waived? We maybe need to get some more information on the specifics of, of kind of that. It scenario, almost sounds like a rupture, a rupture disc or something like that. Sure. I think you, um, you still have to, I'm not sure how you would test that one. 
Have you run into that, Ray? Uh, not often. Uh, I think you would still have to, maybe you would have to do calculations or an FEA in lieu of. Uh, if you're going to use a burst test to prove it, you may be, um, yeah, that's that's a tough situation. That's, that's something I'd have to look at the uh, the code itself to see how that's handled. It hasn't come up very often. I know obviously it exists, but um, you're not designing it to get to four times. So uh, there may be uh, something similar to a pressure relief valve where it's tested and confirmed and verified that it does uh, fail at the design pressure. And that may be what you use in that case. Okay. All right, we'll see if we can maybe get some more clarity or, or potentially follow up, uh, you know, outside the webinar on that one. Yeah, um, that would be that would be better. Okay, very good. Um, all right, got one more here for now. Um, so, you know, if you follow through on those flow charts, um, given your design conditions, and you come to a conclusion that um, there's an exempt there's an exemption, um, does that mean that you know all fittings and components within that system are also exempt from CRN as well? Yes, if the if the system is exempt, everything is exempt. Okay, easy one. Yeah. If the system has to be registered, everything in it has to have a registration. That would be the opposite, but same thing applies. Okay. Um, let's see, we got one more here. Um, and I still encourage people to send them in. We got a few more minutes here, so I'll keep them coming. Um, so uh would a this is specific to fittings um you know a, a pneumatic uh ferrule type fitting um that's you know a quarter inch in size potentially is that is that something that would 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 require crn that would fall into a fitting category it depends if it's i'm assuming it's, it's like a like a ferrule like a like a ferrule or double ferrule uh type fitting compression fitting if it's used for air, a lot of times it's exempt. Okay. Like, yeah. Again, you're gonna have to go. You're gonna have to go through those those uh, flow charts again. So, uh, yeah, Ontario, for instance, it, uh, Steve is yeah. showing there. If it's compressed air less than three quarters of an inch, then it's uh, exempt from registration. So, again, you have to you have to look at each province individually and look at their regulations individually. So. But if if it's not exempt, then the diameter, whether it's quarter inch or, or a half inch or an eighth, uh, it's irrelevant. It still has to be proven. Okay. Um, that I believe is all the questions we have at at this moment. Um, got a couple more minutes. I think uh, Kevin um, has a, a a little wrap up here, but. Um, you know, if there's anything else that you guys are, are thinking of that you'd like to have addressed here uh, by Steve or Ray, um, you know, keep sending them in. And, you know, like I said, we got a couple more minutes so we can get them answered. Uh, or, you know, we'll follow up with you directly after the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to I'm gonna turn this over to Kevin. Thanks, Dan. All right. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, certainly appreciate you and you, Steve and Ray, being a part of this today. And I guess um, our, our, our goal throughout this uh, initiative is really just to bring credible industry knowledge to our customers and uh, really anyone out there that wants to um, find a place to, to gather some information. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to provide many of you customers that are out joining us today with a great deal of components over the years that do have CRN. And uh, we do maintain a database, up, if you think you can see my screen, uh, we do try to maintain a, a database of the actual forms. Uh, many of our customers just require a number, but some actually do require the forms. So um, if you are looking, certainly the the, eng, the website at pvengine.com is a great resource. I've been using it for many years um, to, to try to glean some information and, and, and again, help uh, our customers. But uh, it is a it's a great reference. So Steve and, and Ray, thanks again for being here and being being with us. Um, it will be recorded. It'll be available uh, again on our website and on on their website uh, at the uh, web address at the bottom of the screen. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys again. Uh, and next week, 
Um, we will be having um, expansion joint, why they fail, the do's and don'ts for design, um, how they're anchored, how they're uh, positioned, uh, how they're installed, and we will have host master again. And also uh, on our website, we do have any, uh, any day one-on-one -on -one tailor training. If there's a subject, something that you see on our catalog uh, of training, we'd be happy to get involved with you directly and see how we can help. Um, but if there's nothing else, Dan, any other questions pop in or not? We did have a, a yeah, we did have one just pop in late here. Um, it's uh, it's a very specific situation, so hopefully I do a good job here of articulating it. But um, so category E fittings um, include things like strainers and filters. Um, but this attendee is, is stating that they've they've had some um, issues where they've had to register them as a pressure vessel with a U stamp. Um, and they're saying that that was because of the size. Um, it was for a water application. Um, you know, they included literature, all the requirements, but it, they were still told that they needed to register it um, in Ontario as a pressure vessel. Um, so do you know, you know, what kind of criteria that they, they might have been looking at there um, to determine that, you know, a strainer or filter was required to be registered as a, as a vessel? Yep, it's. I'll just see if I can pull it up here quick on our website. We have an, an article on that. Okay, you can basically send it has to do if it's over six inches. If you want to take this ray while I find it, yeah, I mean, if if it's greater than six inches, um, in most cases, and the volume exceeds one and a half cubic feet, then it's going to be registered as a pressure vessel. Um, you can't just because it may be a strainer. Uh, it's still, once you get past that criteria, it's now an ASME Section 8 vessel. Um, as far as if it was water or not, uh, you would have to look at the, the pressure and temperature and or is there any kind of um, clean in place or something like that that, that may be involved. Um, I, I'd have to know all the details to tell you for sure, uh, but basically, there's there's a flow chart on our on our website uh, and it's from CSA B51 that shows you um, you know what is the actually design. if they show my screen I've got it up all right I'll I'll throw it back to you right now <laughs> I forgot it wasn't uh... yeah so so basically you look at the the diameter so so figure one a is liquid not more hazardous than water. Uh, is it greater than 15 psi? There's your pressure, temperature, and then it asks you for the volume. If it's more than one and a half cubic feet, or is it greater than six inches? If it's not greater than six inches, it's a fitting. If it's more than, than six inches, it's a pressure vessel. So uh, that's that's generally, Steve, just scroll down just a little bit more. Uh, the next flow chart is for a non-lethal gas or a non-lethal liquid. So it may not be, it's more dangerous than water, but it's not going to kill you. And then the last flow chart, 1C, is for lethal substance. So this is what we go through to determine whether it would be a fitting or a vessel registration. Um, in some cases, uh, a fitting bigger than six inches may still be able to be done as a fitting, but like a valve. For instance, a category C valve is a fitting no matter how big it is. It's it's still a valve. Um, yeah. And other so, provinces yeah. like look at yeah. it and say, it doesn't matter how small it is, it looks like a vessel, therefore you're going to register it like a vessel. Right, and Alberta Alberta's uh, famous for that. They will not register a heat exchanger as a fitting. It is a vessel regardless. So mm -hmm. um, again, I, you know, if, if you want to send me an email and, and give me all the uh, information I can maybe explain better. But uh, generally speaking, we follow these flow charts to see if it's a fitting or a vessel. And, and, and as Steve mentioned earlier, uh, there are also reviewers at each of the jurisdictions that have different ideas uh, on how to interpret the code. So you may have one reviewer in Ontario tell you this is a fitting registration and another one tell you it's a vessel. Unfortunately, uh, that's just part of the process right now. And, and hopefully the harmonization will fix that um, because they will have to ask or, or specify that when they're, when they're sent the initial review. And if they don't, then it would be registered as, as per the original. 
Okay, sounds good. Right. Um, I think that's all the questions <coughs> we have at the moment. Um, Kevin, I just pass control back to you if uh, there's anything else you needed to, to mention. No, I uh, I think uh, like again, like to thank everybody. Uh, they're certainly guys are a wealth of information, and uh, again, we've used their website to to look maybe even more smarter than we've been over these years while helping our customers. So for that, we appreciate it. So um, thanks for joining us. And again, You're if you welcome. do have any other application specific uh, uh, questions, you can keep them coming, and um, we'll certainly share any contact information you need with uh, with uh, Steve and Ray. So. Thanks everybody, Thank and see Thanks you next very much. week. All right, Thank you. you got it. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. bye.